Sanmonan. Yeah, figure man, I was driving from the Eastern Cape. I just arrived now. <laughs> just arrived now. Uh, but it's fine. Well, okay. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. I, I think I want to deal with one issue. <clears throat> Maybe it might have other branches, just one issue. Uh, and I think it's, it's an issue that requires us as men to talk about it. Maybe to give our, us ourselves um, a, a picture, a paradigm through which to think. The book of Luke is going to be interesting. Luke chapter 15. We don't have to go there. We're just discussing. Luke chapter 15, there's a parable there. Even those that don't know the Bible have heard about that parable. So the parable ha ha has got... So you find three parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. Those three packaged together. That is why I want us to, to, to really talk as men and really challenge ourselves in a very, very serious way and then deal with some of our issues that are really killing society. Um, so the very, f I mean, preachers have spoken about this. I'm not a preacher, I'm a philosopher today. Um, there's one thing that's interesting here that plays itself out. It is a man that loses a sheep. It is a woman that loses a coin. So the storyteller is sociologically aware that coins are associated with women and sheep associated with men. The third parable, it is a father that loses a son, but it is a mother that gives birth to him. So the, the hidden nugget, the hidden nugget in these three parables is a question of gender. It's a question of gender. And deep within this is a question of gender injustice. Gender injustice. It's not a mistake that it is men who have sheep. It's not a mistake. It's a political, it's a sociological construction. It's not a mistake that the woman is dealing with coins. And to look for these coins, she has to use a broom, cheap broom. When a man is looking for sheep, he's deploying other human beings, human resources. That's how much power a man has. To achieve his dreams, he can deploy other men and delay other men from thinking about their own dreams. There's a chance that by the time most men die, they're going to die not having had a chance to think about what they want. And they will have many things that they wanted. They could be driving cars, but because another man deployed them in that role. But no time had been found to think about what is it that I want. In other words, the answers we've been providing to life we're just copying them from other people's templates. The most irresponsible thing we could do is to die without having thought about what is it that I want. That's the most irresponsible thing to do that we would have done. To think about what me, not, I mean, when we come, we don't decide to go to school. There's already a schooling system prepared for us. So when you do that and you excel in that, it's not something to be excited about. It's already there. The Chinese were the first one to come with a national schooling system. It, is, it was not always there. Somebody decided that the world has to be like this. The responsibility of real men is to be able to stand out of the structures of society and ultimately think, what is my agenda in this life? And that is not easy. It is easy to get money. It's difficult to think about what is my agenda. Does it even involve money? 
No, I'm not talking about that. That's for another day. When you talk about what is success, we'll talk about that. What is success? So, but the point I'm trying to make is that we, rem we need to remain critical of templates that when we feel, we feel like we're ticking all the boxes and say, we've done it. No, 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 no. Who came with a template? That was my issue. That we'll never have a black uh, uh, Adventist president because the template is what is dealing with us. The template is dealing with us. You can send delegates, you can cook house and do all of those things. You don't have control over the, 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 the template. Don't have control over it. You can read the church manual in and out. But you don't have control over even the constitution of how that thing is managed. Who decides? Who decides who has a voice? That's why one of the things that irritates me is to get in situations where things are already decided and all I have to do is just to consent. I've got a problem with that as a man. As a man, I've got a problem with that. But if you are my you are excited, you are at a different level. We'll deal with you some other time. That's for another day. But I'm sorry to raise that issue for sensitive Adventists who think it's normal that when we're the majority in this church, just by God's divine grace, none of us can emerge. It's normal. God. God so loves our white brothers and sisters. And this coincides with the colonial mentality that a black man can't manage anything. And to disrupt him, let's empower women while white men remain in power. But let's leave that. That's for another day. Let's leave that. No, no, no. No, no, it's political. It's... It's, 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 it's political because it's what is called resentimenti. Resentimenti is an idea by a philosopher that means, I mean, you can hear the, the idea of sentimentalism. Is victoryless victory. Victoryless victory. When you're ushered into victories that are victoryless. That's what you're ushered into. Victoryless victory. And you get excited that now I'm, now I'm driving this car. Victoryless victory. We've not started thinking about, but who, where are these parts coming from? Who, who, who has control over the supply chain? When are you coming at the consumer level and you're excited? Yes. I mean, you can qualify for, to buy an expensive car. At the end, the bank already has dealt with everything. When are you getting just, you're being loaned. You can't even, you can't even influence the interest rate. You can't. Who decides on those fundamental things? And this is important for us here. Uh, this is important for us here because if we say this is our land and we, we want to take charge of our place, like any man must take charge of his place. These are questions that we need to understand, to deal with. But we've been dealt with. Look, that's for another day. Where I'm going, it's, it's a challenge that I want to pose. Not these things. These are small things. Where I'm going is here. Where I'm going is here. There's a pattern in this... Uh, in these parables. The pattern is a pattern of creating a particular kind of a world. In none of these parables, you find men and women together. In all of these parables, men are alone and a woman is alone. A woman is alone and other men are by themselves. Why? Why is that? Why is that? Maybe this idea that this is a man's world. This is a man's world. One of the greatest poverties that this, that affects even this text and much of the Bible as well, is men have been comfortable to create a world as if they are the only one that must live in it. One of the deepest insecurities of men is a presence of empowered women. One of the deepest insecurities of men is just the presence of empowered women. 
The woman you find is this particular test. You can tell sociologically, economically, she's disempowered. She has to waste time looking for coins so that she can raise somebody's son while the son is absent. And you expect to have better men when you disempower that manufacturing plant of humanity. So, so, so there's that picture I'm struggling with here. The picture where men locate themselves, position themselves, create the world in their own image. And women as an afterthought, they are, they are roped in, not for themselves, but they are roped in to accommodate and accompany men. And perpetually, men play an active role in engineering structures that undermine women. Perpetually. The net result of that is this. Humanity is weak because the supplementary role that is supposed to be played by women is being undermined by us. That's the issue I want to talk about. That's the issue I want to talk about. How would the Bible have read if some of the books were contributed by women? What perspective would we have found of a person sitting at home, the oikos managing the home, seeing a child on the daily, understanding what it means when the money is not enough in the house? What perspective would have gained? We know about the shepherd, but we don't know about the housekeeper. Her voice is silenced. What we call epistemic injustice. When you create a society where the only people who have a legitimate right to produce knowledge is one group. That's why in the universities we are fighting. Why are we only hearing white voices? As if the only culture that is there is that of white people. We've got experiences that are valid. We, we have experienced the world. We have suffered in the world. We can think. Give us space. I'm responsible for ethics at the business school. I'm a discipline expert. I get there, I look at the textbooks prescribed. And I'm saying, but who's this one? <laughs> who's this one? And the question I asked, when we train our leaders, why are we not conscious about intentionally saying to them, we as black intellectuals can produce an intellectual material that can train leaders? And I said, I want a meeting with my team. We need to consolidate a team that is going to produce a textbook on ethics and governance that is going to be led by black people. And it's not a miracle, this thing. I've already written 10 books alone, so what's the struggle with that? If you can't do it, I'll do it. I've got capacity. I have. <laughs> and no, it's in the internet. It's not me. You can go to the Muzama Emilfe, you'll see. And it's not published uh, in some street in Konsoweto. Very serious publishers. But the point, and when I did it, it was political. I can't go to university and be taught by white people, reading from white people's textbooks, and then come back and re-engineer the system and say, I'm an expert on Plato. Who's Plato? Who's Plato? Who? Who's Plato? So, so but the point I'm, I'm, I'm getting to is this, as much as racially, we have been deprived by the white world of, of enjoying what it means to be fully human. There's something we're doing as men. We have, we have killed systematically our partners to stand elevated, confident, so that we have a better human project. Without women empowered by our side, we won't, we won't know what it means to be a real man. Otherwise, you have men running around with their insecurities. Yeah. Men running around with black cards. It's the only thing they can run with. That's the only thing you can run with. You can control economically. So you're no different than a slave master. No different than an oppressor. Because you can threaten by withdrawing resources. That's why I don't get excited when a man does a lot for a woman. The more he does, he's trying to subjugate her. Put her in a position where you transfer 10 million to her and see if she will stay with you. <laughs> Test her love. Say, baby, here is 10 million. Let's see what's going to happen. I don't know what she's going to do, but that's exactly the point. 
Why can't we put people where we don't know what they're going to do? So their love is true for us. Even what we are getting is love. We're not even sure it's love. Maybe it's a beautiful big house. Maybe it's a comfortable car that she's driving every day because of you. If you remove those things, remove those things and test love. So real men must be hungry for something real. Not this, not, not this bot thing. It's difficult to be a man. How do you live beyond this fear of fear? Where you work hard enough to be comfortable about other people being independent from you. Working to that level psychologically. Ah, since I would, I think. It's not a tender document, I think. And that's, that's, that's the real issue that we are facing. That's the real issue that we are facing. We are afraid to empower these people. We are afraid to do that. And why have an issue with that? I have an issue with that theologically, for starters. We say they are equally created in the image of God. So when we deprive them their status as partners, we are undermining even our theology. We're undermining our theology. It is not the destiny of a woman to be created in the image of her husband. It is not the status. It's not the destiny of a woman. That is not her destiny. Her destiny is divine. Her destiny is divine. Some of us men are so weak that no woman deserves us. No woman deserves us because we drop only not only the standard of God, we drop the standard of men. The ruling principle in our lives is the fear and money. What we call democracy, the rule of money. Make no mistake, we need this money as men. <laughs> Don't make that mistake and say I'm giving up on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> they don't make that mistake but when we have it psychologically where are we psychologically where are we let me tell you something why as Africans we are not developing because we fail to develop our own families that is why we can't even change society that's where the problem is that's where the problem is. That is why we are not thinking about big issues as a society. That's why we're not thinking about that. Because we have not understood what it means to treat human beings that are close to us. The one that you say you love. What can you do in people in Clip Town or in Orange Farm when you are struggling with your wife here? Struggling to empower her. I grew up in a society that says if you give a woman a letter, she will leave you. And when she leaves this because she has realized that you don't have capacity. Don't blame her for leaving you. Blame yourself. I don't have capacity. How do you give other people the ladder when you're downstairs? You have a problem. You have no business with ladders. Let alone people that can climb. You should be struggling with yourself. So, so, so that's, the, that's, that's the image, that, that's the challenge that each one of us individually must raise with ourselves. And most of us who have got daughters as well, that's a question we must grapple with. This thing of trying to raise our daughters to be husbands, that thing is outdated, guys. That thing of training our daughters to be husbands, to other people, to be nice, to know how to cook, that thing is outdated. We should be training our daughters to become human. And they will make choice about how to manage issues of food. Those are minor things. You don't go around teaching a cow how to eat. Eventually, it will sort out that thing. It's a minor thing. The child will observe. They will sort out those things. We should be dealing with real human issues. Real human issues. Take into school. That thing is not a big issue. If you are talented, you are going to pass. If you are not talented, we must teach you how to work a little bit harder. If you don't have what it takes, we must take you to do woodwork. Do something. That's all that matters. It's not a big deal. This thing of schooling is very unjust itself. It assumes that there's only one type of intelligence. And only those that have that intelligence will be able to make it. But when we are real men, we want to create even opportunities for those who can be accommodated by these schools. It's about expanding opportunities. But we're not thinking there. We're not thinking. We're thinking uh, uh, very narrowly. So my issue with this particular text is just that. The fear to give women their place. Look at how Christ deals with this issue. 
men are sitting in a church um, and they're women and they stand up. It's time for offering. It's time for money. Let me put it out, you get it. It's time for money. In a society like this, who's most likely to have money? It's men. They stand up. The Bible says they're rich. They stood up. And they gave. The rich gave. And the Bible says, a poor widow. Poor widow. Very, very, that's why the Bible is very careful. So not, not only does it tell you her economic status, it also tells you her marital status. She's menless. She's menless. It tells you that she's, the man is dead. So the death of a man is a death economically. That's what it means. She can't own wealth in the Jewish economy. Even when her husband was rich, that wealth will be transferred to the church. Then this money, then the church will give her money to keep her poor. Because women have got no use for money. Women have got no vision. Women have got no dreams. All you have to do... Uh, 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 no, but these times are uh, conflicting. The, the brief I got is a different time from that. Okay, where, where was I before? Uh, I was, so, she then stands up. The money that she got from church, she takes it back to church. To make, to make a very fundamental statement, which most of us men are struggling with, I am sustained by God. How many of us genuinely believe that we are sustained by God? I'm not talking jokes here. How many of us genuinely believe that I'm sustained by God? How many of us look at our degrees? How many of us... And by sustained by God, I don't mean this thing of equal as bothering people at night. I'm not talking about that. And these people just, boy, you know, another fellow called me, and I was just, this fellow calls me, he, he, he tells me his name, I don't know you, my brother. He then, he then wakes me psychologically. I, 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 I don't expect you to do what I'm going to ask, but it is your choice. I'm like, but that is obvious, it's my choice. <laughs> I mean, you understand those things that are obvious. When people start telling you obvious things, you must be very, very worried. But why? Is this person minor, majoring on obvious things? Uh, and then he explains this thing to me. He tells me that America, how his big things are coming for him. And I'm saying, but why these details? And then ultimately he gets to what he wants. You know? And then I, I then address him. I say, my brother, look, man, I'm turned off by your approach. Because when I is very clear that you are an object of pity and, and, and sympathy. But what you are doing, you are trying to psych me up. I'm a reasonable person. I'm a poor black brother like you. If you need something, simply say you need something. He quoted some spirit of prophecy for me. And then I had to quote as well. I said, Eleanor, it says our greatest argument to God is that we need nothing else. I, I had to quote. He quoted this man. Went to volume nine. I went to steps to Christ. The greatest <laughs> argument is that you need. If you tell me that you need, you see what I mean? As a black man, who understands a need like a black man? I don't care what level of life you are. You, under, you get home, you realize, hey, there's a problem. Yeah, they need something and it must come from you. And you must make a plan. We know this thing. I don't want anyone to. And I told him, my brother, your approach is not going to assist you. It's not going to assist you. I'm not talking about that level of people. No, no. Not there. But I'm trying to say, get to a point even when God sends you to people to assist you, you are moved, not because of pride or anything else, because you understand that you are sustained by God. Yes, sustained by God. Even as you have your networks and your connections, networks and your connections, your education, you say, this is a seed that God has given me to plant. I expect to eat from it because the one who utters it and the one who gives it the sun is not me, it's him. So even when this tree died, dry, dries out and dies, I am not sustained by the tree. Not, that belief is what we need. And then when you have that belief, you approach even your partner differently. She's not kept by my money. One of the biggest insecurities that, I'm talking about real men must tell, one of the biggest insecurities that threatens every man is what happens when this thing goes. Deep inside when you are sleeping, that's what bothers you. It eats you. Because I'm a kanda, I'm a 
Ahamba, imoto ya hamba. And you are asking yourself as they leave, who else is living? And the deep question of faith is who's been sustained? Who's been giving you these things? So I'm not coming to tell you real man, uh, I'm coming to say work on your faith about who's sustaining you. And your faith must be strong enough to empower women. Our faith must be strong enough. No more must she be dealing with coins. We must give her bigger responsibilities. No more must she be doing that. No more must be she saving our agendas. She must be doing something better than that. It's not about percentages. It's about the value of what they can bring. But this percentage thing is politics of men trying to manage numbers. <laughs> it's men trying to manage numbers. So for me, that's, that's the real issue. That's the real issue. Let me hit one last thing on this issue. Let me hit one last thing. And I'm talking to Adventist men here. Because of the way we relate with women as things that we can buy subconsciously, one of the places that I find to have sexual predators like any other I've experienced is the Seventh-day Adventist. I'm talking like this because I know this thing, I'm a preacher. The worst thing you'll find in the church to stand in front of women is a preacher. I wish we can close that chapter. Say, preachers, please don't stand in front of women. If you preach, we put you behind the wall. They must not see you, you must not see them because you are a danger to yourself and to them. As you are preaching here, as you are preaching here, you think of yourself as a porn star. You are thinking of new things to do. Many of, our, many of our women will never convert in the church because they have seen a preacher naked. You can open the Bible upside down. Nothing will move her. She has seen the nakedness of a preacher. No amount of righteousness, no amount of elevating the cross will reach that woman. Must remove the preacher because he's an obstacle to the gospel. So we must constantly challenge ourselves. I had impregnated a woman. I had impregnated a woman in Star and Pangin. When I went to Star and Pangin, everyone knew about it, but no one knew about it. No one had the audacity to come to me and say, my brother, you can't talk to us right now. Your woman is pregnant in Johannesburg. She's going to give birth to a son named after you, Musamai. You can't. Everyone knew it. Not even my friends came talk to me. Say, but I'm relax, my brother. You know why? We are complicit. If I stop him, he's going to stop me. As you are sitting with me, you are planning on your next project. Because we have not come to see women as partners, as, as human beings. We see them as things to drop on them. Seeds that we have no interest to develop. If we don't drop them in them, we put them in plastics. Most responsible thing is to walk around with seeds in the plastic. It's a picture of a responsible man in our society. When we're in trouble, look, I'm dealing with this culture because I had to confront myself about it. That I stand in front of students. I must start seeing human beings that come from poor communities in the Eastern Cape. The last thing they want is my penis. That's the last thing they want. They're dealing with real human issues of a failing government. Failing government. Failing father. Failing Duna, they failed by everyone. And me, the only thing Kichimangayo, he lent to Yamelengayo. When humanity is hungry for our contribution. So the biggest problem I have as a man now is how do I deal with this thing that I was taught in Soweto? Taught by Jomani. But what I'm seeing is that everywhere we go, this thing has been taught to us. That a man, a pride of a man is to sleep with as many women as possible. The only difference is that some are dealing with low grade, some are dealing with high grade. But all of us are the same. And the different grades is for undermining each other. That was the pants when you dark. And when I raised these issues with us, it's because I'm saying we've got a lot of work to do. And I've seen the abstract theology from held back. Ah, ah, if only you are king in corner, Kima, Kima, Kima. When a woman sends a nude, you must say, Ah, ah, no, my sister. Ah, ah, no, man. Adam, the first thing he did was to cover the nakedness. Cover it. Cover it. Cover it. It's not meant to be shared. That's the thing that I'm struggling with as a man. 
I'm struggling with that personally. I've got six children. A third of my salary every month goes there. But I'm thankful to God that it has not affected my comfort. Some of you are running away from your responsibility. I've got six kids. Two in the Val, two in Sentin, two in Mtata. Every month, every, this man knows, my friend. The every month, every month, every month I send that money faithfully. And I'm saying, here is my Range Rover. Here it is. Here it is. There, there it is. Why? Because of this culture that I must, I must deflower. I must overcome as many as possible. The difference between me and others is that others know. My visa is out. My visa is pulled out. I'm talking to men. That's the difference between me and others. Others here are living secretly with diseases. Secretly. Even from their own partners. Why? Because of this problem. Others are our children that are not ours. And that one kills me. That one kills me. That even our elders are involved in those things. They're involved. And the settings that all of us know, but no one knows. I cry for these children. Imagine the mentality of that child. Every day seeing his father. But his father only acknowledges him, acknowledges him privately. What happens to the boy here? What happens here? Real men must stand up. When I went back to the pool, I got baptized. There's a preacher. I was at my prime. My papa is. He called the king. Just as we come out, the pastor who was baptizing me was making moves on this woman. Because there's a problem. We have a problem. We have a problem. So, Maskwama gender based violence and all of that. There's this one. You are my predators here. One of predators, and I'm talking to Adventists here, that these men who are weak, the only time they're strong is when they sleep with another person's wife. We need to deal with that disease in this church. The only time you feel you are better, this guy is a professor, I need to show him that he's smaller than me. I'm going to sleep with his wife. People don't understand why I don't allow people to my house. If people are not coming to my house. They're coming to check how expensive my couches are so that they can come with better things. Don't come to my house. You are, you are a predator. You look at me, you look at my wife, you think that she's not good enough for me. It's a problem we have in this church. That is why we never empower each other. Because you are afraid that when I'm empowered, you won't have access to my things. You won't be able to undermine me. No one will help you like an Adventist. They will not help you. They will watch you. They will watch you. They will watch you. They will pray for you. They will do it, not help you. Because they are afraid of your capacity. Nothing, nothing intimidates Adventists like that. It intimidates us to empower another person. How many millionaires have we created amongst ourselves? How many jobs do we give each other here? How, how, how? Have we sat down with the list and say, guys, there's a job at my work. I want to empower someone. It's a good paying job. You see what I mean? It's because of this psychology of fear. We, become, we feel better when others are inferior to us. And those who are not inferior to us, we look for ways to make them inferior. And one of the ways is to, is to, is to, is to pursue their women and wives. I want to pray. I want to pray with someone who says, I'm tired of being a, this thing of a man I've been. I want to be a real man. I want to empower my partner, my woman, and any other woman I find. I want to empower her. I want to support her. I want to believe in her. I don't want to find reasons why she's not good enough. I want to empower her. Whether it's my daughter, whether it's somebody else, I want to empower her. Those ones that I've been taking advantage of, I want to release them and empower them. I want to release them. Today, we need to release them. We want to deal with our fears, our insecurities, that God is not going to take care of us. God, God can take care of us. God can, take, God can do more. God can do more. God can do more. He did it for me. You know, when I was taken to court for maintenance in, 20, in 2017, God came through for me. The following month, I got a better paying job. Following month. God said, you have messed up, but I'm going to cover your shame. I'm going to cover. He, he covers my shame. 
One of the things that I don't suffer from is an insult that I can take of my children. I can be insulted for other things. Wang Shia, you did this and that, but not for that. God said, I'm going to cover your shame. He has done it consistently. He has done it consistently. Because when you hand over your business to him, he will take care of your business. I messed up, man. At my age, six, I messed up. I messed up. I never thought I could afford the car that I afford now. I never thought I could go and sit in the meetings. That I, I was supposed to be covered in shame. But because there's grace. So I'm going to take care of you, young man. I've got a plan for you. And his plan is working out. His plan is working out. Why? So that when we have messed up, he gives us an opportunity to improve. And I know some of you are afraid standing there. I'm saying my own testimony. My own testimony. I'm not talking uh, Greek on these things. I'm not talking, I'm talking these things. Musama is going to send me a text, Daddy. Lugaka is going to say, Daddy, because they know that they've got a father. And I have to improve in that so that they become better men. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. It was a mistake that, Lord, I drove to. It was not a mistake that I drove to this place. We are there, Lord. We are, we are controlled by fear. We are beholden to what we've acquired or what we could acquire. We put our faith in these things and we belittle you. Today, Lord, we're taking you out of the, of the glass beaker. We know that you're bigger than that. Take your place in our lives. You're the one who sustains us. The fear that rules and ruins us. Please, Lord, heal us from it. We saw it in our fathers. Now it has come to us. Lord, let it stop now. You are God and you are in charge. Release us from that fear. Lord, empower us so that we can empower others. Lord, free us so that we can want to free others. Lord, we've gotten used to the habit of what we've been doing all these lives. All this time. We've caused so much damage, both in the church and outside. And Lord, we ask for courage to believe that we can do differently. We ask for opportunities to improve. Lord, there are those that are close to us that we have undermined. Whether we have raped them, whether we have belittled them, whether we have not allowed them to stretch their wings like eagles. Oh Lord, forgive us. Give us a different vision. Give us a different perspective. When all has been said and done, we want to be like Jesus. We want, when a prostitute comes to us and bathes us with an oil and money gotten from prostitution, we don't see that history. We see her future. That you can be better. And we allow her to touch us and not feel any sensation of wanting to take advantage of her. But see love expressed intimately. Liberate us, Lord. The tears of women, whether it's our mothers, whether it's our sisters, whether it's our cousin, help us, Lord, to be the ones that wipe them away. And where the opportunity is to empower, give us a sight and a vision to do so. Lord, there's a sin that is prevalent in your church. The sin of predating over women. It's here in this place. We know of cases. Lord, we want this place to be a, a place of healing. Let that healing begin with us. Forgive us, Lord. Empower us. Give us the courage, Lord, to do better. To do more for humanity. This we pray trusting in nothing but the merits of Jesus. Amen.